Yates has seven front row starts at Daytona, and David Gilliland goes to the top of the chart by a quarter of a second. Hey everyone, I'm Ben Schneider. And last time on this series, I covered my first cup race, the 2006 UAW Ford 500 at Talladega. When I started this series, I was planning to do episode 3 on my first Bush Series race. But like I said at the end of the last video, I got to thinking about 2007 Daytona 500 qualifying. The first cup qualifying session I can remember watching. And the truth of the matter is, there are actually a few connections that we're able to make between that race and this qualifying session. Not to mention, there are a lot of other storylines we can cover as well by taking a look back here. So today, join me as we relive pole qualifying for the 2007 edition of the Great American Race. And let me clarify, before we get into it, I'm mostly just going to be talking about Sunday qualifying for the front row here. As I mentioned in the truck video, I didn't have cable growing up, and so I didn't watch the duels since they were on speed, I'm not going to cover them here. Just to give you an idea of how much times have changed, 61 cars showed up to qualifying for Daytona in 2007. Yep, that's right. 18 teams and drivers were sent home. Nowadays, NASCAR can barely get a full field of 40 for the Daytona 500, let alone your average race throughout the season. But hey, charters will be good for the sport, am I right? Because there are 61 cars here, I'm not going to go through everybody. But I do want to walk you through this qualifying session and highlight some of the more important stories that came out of it as well as giving the smaller teams a moment or two in the spotlight. Just in case you're unfamiliar with how Daytona 500 qualifying works, the front row is set during single car qualifying. The rest of the field is set based on the results of the twin qualifying races on Thursday. So there's only two grid spots that are going to be locked up today. It's fitting that the first car to go out is Brian Vickers. And as a young kid who had only ever seen the fall Talladega race the year before, I recognized Vickers' name since he won that Talladega race. What I didn't recognize was his number, his team, and even the make of car he was driving. As I mentioned briefly in the last video, Vickers was already on his way out of Hendrick by the time the 2006 season was coming to an end. Maybe it's a good thing he wasn't allowed in Hendrick team meetings by the time he inadvertently wrecked Jimmy to get his first win. His destination for 2007 was the new Red Bull racing team partnered with a new manufacturer in Toyota. Toyota had had success since joining the truck series a few years earlier. But the pressure is on them now more than ever since they've made the jump to the Cup Series. Ricky Rudd is back after taking a year off. He's taken over the second Yates car from Dale Jarrett, who's moved to Michael Waltrip's new Toyota team in the offseason. Rudd's paced both practice sessions so far, and if the 2006 Fall Talladega race was any indication, the Yates car should certainly be threats for the pole. In other Toyota news, Waltrip is seen standing next to the NASCAR hauler chatting with Mike Helton about an issue that will lead to a massive fine and points penalty. Long story short, something strange was noticed in Waltrip's intake manifold that was suspected to increase horsepower. The content was later revealed to be jet fuel, and Waltrip was docked 100 points before the season even started. It's a hole he wouldn't fully climb out of until Dover in June, as he'd failed to qualify for 11 straight races after the 500. Joe Nemechek has a new number, but he's still technically with the same team as last year. MB2 Motorsports is now Ginn Racing after Bobby Ginn purchased the team. Kenny Wallace crosses the stripe as Fox comes back from commercial. Like Vickers and Nemechek, he's a go-or-go-homer, meaning he's one of the 26 drivers who needs to qualify for the race on speed since his car wasn't in the top 35 in owner's points the previous season. Furniture Row really came a long way in 10 years, didn't they? Denny Hamlin is the first driver to qualify who was in the top 35 in owner points, which means he's locked into the field. He's coming off of a Rookie of the Year season with Gibbs, and puts down a lap time strong enough for provisional pole. But 2005 Rookie of the Year Kyle Busch takes it from him right away. David Reagan, our 2007 rookie who's replaced Mark Martin in Roush's flagship six car, comes up a few cars later to take the pole from Bush. Mike Wallace was due to take his lap next, but mechanical trouble forces him back to pit road to see if they can diagnose the problem. Regan Smith is next on track in the 39 car for Ginn. He'll split most of the season with Mark Martin in the L1 Army car, but Ginn decided to go ahead and enter a fourth car for him at Daytona to get him some extra experience. This means he'll have to qualify in speed, though. Wallace's team does eventually go out to make their run, but he's more than two seconds off the pace of even the slowest qualifiers so far. Former Truck Series winner Brandon Witt makes his qualifying run shortly thereafter in the CGM Racing 72 car. It's the team David Gilliland made his cup debut with in 2006 before Yates picked him up to replace Elliott Sadler. Here's something kind of cool I never noticed before. 
If you look in the background of this picture, you can see Rusty Wallace waving on the other side of the booth. That's the ESPN crew doing a rehearsal as they get ready to call the Bush Series race on Saturday. All right, as you know, Fox has the season Daytona to Dover. TNT takes over for six races. And then the new guys are back. Where's Rusty Wallace? <laughs> Next door. <laughs> Give us a wave, Rusty. Where they're rehearsing hey, for uh, ABC and ESPN with Jerry Punch and Andy Petrie. I told him he ain't going to be able to sit down when he gets into the real game. 2007 Budweiser shootout winner Tony Stewart makes his qualifying run next, eighth fastest of the cars that have gone so far. Next is the defending NASCAR Cup champion and defending Daytona 500 winner Jimmy Johnson, who turns the fastest first lap of the Chevrolets, but only ends up fourth fastest overall. Dave Blaney is the second Toyota to go out and qualify, and he's the only Toyota that has owner's points from the previous season to fall back on. 2002 Daytona 500 winner Ward Burton returns after a year off, driving for Morgan McClure Motorsports. Perennial ARCA champion Frank Kimmel is up next. He's truly one of the most underrated champions in all of motorsports. Jimmy Johnson may have won seven cup championships, but coming into this season, Kimmel's won the last seven ARCA championships in a row, and eight overall. He'd finish his career with ten championships, the last coming for Thor Sport in 2013. But for this race, he's in an unsponsored Ford owned by Andy Hillenberg as he tries to make his first cup start since 2002. David Gilliland comes up next. He won the pole at Talladega in October, finished second in the Budweiser shootout last night, and to top it all off, puts his Robert Yates Racing Ford on provisional pole. Yates has seven front row starts at Daytona, and David Gilliland goes to the top of the chart by a quarter of a second. He picked up five and a half tenths. Good job, 48 man. 48 30. Good job. Same thing he ran yesterday. Right at, I mean, just very close. So, at least uh, Rudd, he ran a 19 yesterday. We'll see if he can back his up. Now he just has to wait for 30 or so cars to make their runs. Reed Sorensen is able to lay down his first lap, but has some sort of problem on the second, forcing him to abort the lap and return to the pits. Vickers' replacement in the Hendrick 25 car is Casey Mears, who's the fourth and final Hendrick car to qualify and sets a lap time similar to those of his teammates. Next up is the car Mears vacated, the 42 Chip Ganassi Racing Dodge driven by former Formula One and IndyCar star Juan Pablo Montoya. He made his cup debut in Homestead in 2006 and looked impressive in the ARCA race at Talladega the previous fall. And Montoya lays down a lap time good enough for P2 on the board just behind Gilliland. Dale Earnhardt Sr.'s former crew chief, Kirk Shelmerdine, brings out his own number 27 car. He qualified for last year's 500, but he'll need to race his way in on Thursday since his time today isn't quick enough. After Greg Biffle makes his run, we're introduced to 72-year-old James Harvey Hilton. Hilton's a longtime veteran of the ARCA series and a longtime independent racer, and he even won two Cup Series races and finished second in Cup points three times. And here he is now, 14 years removed from his last Cup start, trying to qualify for the Great American Race. Bill Davis Racing's Truck Series driver, Mike Skinner, is running an extra car for the team as they try to make the Daytona 500. He's the third Toyota to go out for qualifying, and he too has to qualify on time. David Stremme then goes second fastest just ahead of Montoya, his teammate. Hollywood stuntman Stanton Barrett struggles to get up to speed in his Rick Ware Racing Chevrolet. 1988 champion Bill Elliott needs to qualify on speed in his front row motorsports Dodge, but he has the past champion's provisional to fall back on. However, Dale Jarrett is a much more recent champion and also has to qualify on speed. So should they both need to use it, the provisional would go to Jarrett instead, meaning Elliott isn't necessarily locked into the field just yet. As Hilton continues to get ready for his run, one of my favorites, A.J. Allmendinger, brings the second Red Bull Toyota out to qualify. Allmendinger won five races in the Champ Car Series in 2006, and he even got a top five at the truck race in Talladega in October. But making his cup debut in the Daytona 500 for a brand new team with a brand new manufacturer is going to be a tall order. And it's so simple that even I, can I, can I work with this one? That even if you work, oops, what, ha what happens if, uh, oh, if that no, comes off? Oh, no, you done broke it. Get out of there. Put, you need, get just get out of there. On. Don't worry, we'll cover this. Even in 2007, Fox was screwing up and missing on track action. Ken Schrader brings his Wood Brothers Ford out to qualify, only going 30th fastest. And Mike Joy mentions that Eric McClure went 36th fastest while Fox was too busy focusing on Chris Myers messing up the DLP Ultimate Picture Cam. Jeremy Mayfield brings the third and final Bill Davis Toyota out to qualify. He's the fastest Toyota so far, and currently third of the cars not already locked in. Waltrip then brings his Toyota out with a new intake manifold to make his run. Larry, when's the last time you remember somebody starting up a new operation 
not just for one car, not just for two cars, but for three cars. I'm not sure that has ever happened before. And it's never going to happen again thanks to the wonderful charter system. Former truck champion Mike Bliss goes 39th fastest, while Fox is in commercial. And 2004 Daytona 500 winner Dale Earnhardt Jr. comes out next. Hey, apparently Derek Cope made an attempt. Fox must have missed him too. He's the 1990 winner of this race. And he even ran the fall Talladega race last year in the same McGlynn Racing 74 car. But he's second slowest, so he'll obviously need a strong qualifying race on Thursday to make the field. Meanwhile, Jr. goes 19th quickest. Road course ringer Boris Said goes 5th fastest and fastest among the go-or-go -go homers, which is hardly a surprise since he started on pole and finished 4th of a July race at Daytona the previous year. Another distinction Jarrett holds is he is the last driver to win the Daytona 500 and then win the series championship in the same year. That was 1999. Hold on a second, Mike. Didn't Jimmy just do that last year? Ricky Rudd comes out right after Jarrett. And he puts up a time good enough for second right behind his teammate David Gilliland. If their times stand, Yates will have locked out the front row, just as they did in the 2000 Daytona 500 and in the last Cup Series restrictor play race. Mark Martin goes out next in his new 01 Army car for Gin Racing. And now, James Hilton makes his highly anticipated qualifying run. I'll let the Fox booths tell a little bit more about his story. Now, Rudd returns to Daytona after a year away from racing. How about this man? The last time James Harvey Hilton raced in the Daytona 500, David Gilliland was six years old. 1983 was Hilton's last Daytona 500 start. Mike, I got to give you some names of guys that have won poles. This is this is back in the day now. Fireball, Fonny, Cotton, Shepard, Goober, Goober. Gober. 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 Sorry. Yeah. It's okay. Banjo, Pardue, Red Baron, Friday, Emmanuel Savakis, Perk, Lou, Possum, Elmo, Moon, Trickle. Guys that have won poles in NASCAR. What happened to all those guys? James Hilton had four poles in his cup career, yes, along he did. with a victory at Richmond in 1970 and on the big super speedway at Talladega in 1972. His last cup race, Darlington in March of 1993. You know, Mike, I talked to James down here at the test back in January, and he told me, you know, he, he's, he's leased this engine from Richard Childress Racing. He actually bought this car from Richard Childress Racing. And he said, you know, Larry, I know it's gonna be a stretch for me to make the Daytona 500, but he said, one thing I know, I'm going to get to test this car, I'm going to get to practice this car, and I know I will at least get to race in the dual races on Thursday. Well, the other question it would answer to someone like him is, what would it be like to drive one of the cars they're driving today? If I had really top-notch equipment, how would I have stacked up? If What if I'd have had this car 25 years ago, 30 years ago? How would I have stacked up? And so what's it like to drive a first-class car? And this is first-class equipment. Hilton only goes 50th quickest. And to his credit, he'll give it a good run in the dual races but he will unfortunately fail to make the 500. Last year's pole sitter Jeff Burton makes his qualifying run, and his car is nowhere near fast enough to get the pole for this year's race, as he only goes 45th fastest. Kevin LePage makes his run, and it isn't fast enough to get him in the race. He's raced his way in on Thursday the previous two years, and will need to do so again this year. David Rudiman's MWR Toyota isn't fast enough either, which locks Johnny Sauter into the top three of the fastest go or go homers, along with Boris Said and Sterling Marlin. This guarantees the three of them will make the 500. Carl Edwards and Tony Raines are the last two cars to go, and neither of them are fast enough to get on the front row. So that's it. Just as they did in qualifying at Talladega in the fall, Robert Yates Racing's 38 car qualifies on pole, and the team's 88 car is on the outside of row one. With Ricky Rudd on the outside, his sixth career front row start, he's a pass pole sitter. And Dick Bergeron is with the 33rd different driver to win the pole for the Great American Race. And on Wednesday of last week, he set foot in Daytona for the very first time in his life. And now you're on the pole for the Daytona 500. Can you believe it? No, I can't, man. I've, uh, I've said I've been pinching myself for about the last eight months. And uh, I ain't going to quit anytime soon, obviously. I'm uh, real proud. I mean, the guys brought a great M&M's Ford Fusion here this weekend. And uh, Todd Parrott, you know, with all his experience and success he's had here and 
and Yates, Robert Yates and Doug Yates, boy, the engine package and, and the car that, that all the guys in the shop have prepared for me to come out here today is just unbelievable. And how about Mars, uh, Snickers and M&M's front row for the Daytona 500? That is, uh, that's awesome, man. Uh, we ju we're just real glad that we could step up like they stepped up and uh, sponsored our team. And hopefully this will be a, a great start to a great relationship and, uh, you know, a good start to the year. How about this, Mike? A short tracker on the pole for the Daytona 500. What a wonderful story, a breakthrough win in Kentucky last summer, propelled him to Robert Yates Racing, a pole at Talladega, second last night in the shootout, and now he's on the pole for the 500. I've got to say, single car qualifying is far from boring, and it makes me wonder why NASCAR ever moved away from it in the first place. Every driver gets the track to themselves for two time laps, and you simply set the field based on lap times. More sponsors get exposure, and more stories get told, and I'm glad NASCAR's gone back to using it. So with that, Fox signs off from Daytona, and the teams get ready for the duels on Thursday. I mentioned briefly that ESPN would be calling the Bush race on Saturday, and they'd actually be doing the entire 2007 Bush series season on their family of networks. But again, I didn't have access to cable at this point in my life. So as for me, I wouldn't get to discover the series until they put a race on ABC. Here goes Birdie on the high side. Bush makes the block out of turn four. Burton squeezes high. They are door to door. Up next... Bushwhacking gets taken to a whole new level. Let's revisit the 2007 Samstown 300 at Las Vegas Motor Speedway.